Once upon a time, there was a young couple named Malloy. Now, Mike Malloy was very proud of his bride, and Molly Malloy was very proud of Mike, although she still wasn't used to being called Mrs. Malloy. As you can plainly see, neither Mike, nor Molly, nor Chauncey, their car, had a care in the world. making better time than we are. Oh, the Bluebird! Oh, Mike, it's a beautiful train. Gee, I wish we were on it. Now, if you heard a pretty girl make a wish, wouldn't you do something about it? Hey! I wish we could see the rest of it. That's easy. We're all proud of the bluebird. I'll show it to you. Say, this is real luxury, isn't it? Hey, comfortable looking seats. Sleepy hollow seats, we call them. Use them throughout the train. Let's go into the drawing room, which is available if you want privacy. You can even have meals served here. That's wonderful. My, this is interesting. There are several throughout the train. This is another parlor car. You'll notice it has a dome, too. This Bluebird room is for lounging, for private parties, or for business conferences. Say, that's important to executives. Nobody loses time. And for those who wish, a cocktail lounge. And the dining car. Automatic doors. Andy, huh? This is one of our dome coaches. We have a coffee shop. And for coach passengers, a club car. My, it's a beautiful train. Who thought of all this? Many artists and designers, and at least 70 other kinds of specialists. Many, of course, from the Wabash's own mechanical and passenger departments. It's a big job to design a modern streamliner. A modern train like the Bluebird must cost a fortune. Well, the Bluebird cost nearly $2 million. And that's only a drop in the bucket compared to the total we're spending on new equipment. 
Of course, the Bluebird has a lot of under-the-hood features you can't see. For example, soundproofing to ensure a more quiet ride. The springing system of the roller-bearing wheels we're riding on and the special couplers between the cars and an individual air conditioning unit for each car. Say, what about the Bluebird's engine? How fast can it go? It could go 120 miles an hour, but it doesn't. Instead, the thousands of horsepower controlled by this little lever in the engineer's hand are used to get the train up to normal running speed as soon as possible and keep it there for steady, on-time running. We call these locomotives diesels, but they're actually driven by electric motors with power generated by diesel engines. You see, a diesel's at least twice as efficient as the old iron horse. So now we use diesels for practically all of our trains. Let's hear the other one, Jack. Two horns. What for? One for the country, the other for town. The Wabash tries to be a good neighbor, you know. Speaking of the iron horse, it seems to me that the real old engines were more, well, more romantic somehow. I wish I could have been there. Welcome to the Rogers. About to begin the first railroad trip ever made in the Mississippi Valley. Step aboard, folks, step aboard, and help us make this day, November the 8th, 1838, a bright spot in history. Welcome to the Rogers. Well, welcome to the Rogers. going to be a long ride, folks, but it's bringing railroading to the Mississippi Valley. And believe me, things are going to move mighty fast after that. You can bank on the Wabash, the friendly, friendly road. You can bank on the Wabash to bear your heavy load. For its branches like fingers stretch over fertile land. The heart of our country lies in its friendly hand. As the trains go, they say hello to people far and near. And the bluebird is the new word in travel. Comfort cheer to St. Louis, Chicago. Wherever you're aboard, you can bank on the Wabash, the friendly, friendly road. Why, I got me a hunch that one of these days, this little eight-mile section of high iron we're riding on will be a railroad system of 2,400 miles, stretching all the way from Buffalo to Kansas City and Omaha, from St. Louis to Chicago and Detroit, right through the heart of America. A bridge line joining the railroads of the nation, north and south, east and west. I can see it clear. It's not going to matter to those fellows what the contour of the land is. They'll use bridges viaducts or tunnels, whatever it takes to keep the train to the Wabash running fast and smooth. Even something as big as Lake Michigan won't stop them. Why, they'll just put the whole train on a boat and cross to the other side, summer or winter. And rivers? Shucks, why, they'll ferry trains across the Detroit River to Canada and send them on to Buffalo in the east. Cause speed will be mighty important to shippers and that's what they'll get. I reckon shippers will learn they can bank on the Wabash. 
Why, one of these days, I bet you they'll have passenger trains that'll go swooshing along faster than a mile a minute or more. They'll be trains with names of their own, trains that'll be regular hotels on wheels, trains you can actually sleep in. Individual rooms that a flick of the finger will turn into comfortable private bedrooms. All sizes, too, for one person or two or a whole family. And along with all the trains, there'll be what they'll call stations. In Kansas City, in suburban St. Louis, and downtown St. Louis, in Toledo, and Detroit, in Chicago, and in Omaha, and in a lot of other cities, big and little. Of course, I won't ever see them, but they'll have them. And the freight trains they're going to have. Fast and run on tight schedules like passenger trains. Can't hardly believe my own predictions. But I figure the railroads are going to haul practically everything used in the whole United States. Heavy stuff, light stuff, great big pieces of equipment. This country will always depend on its railroads. War and peace, bad times and good. Why, sure as I'm standing here, they'll find ways of keeping fruits and vegetables fresh as daisies, so they can be hauled clean across the country, from California, New Mexico, Texas, the Northwest, just about from anywhere. And they'll have places bigger than houses. The railroad will own them itself where farmer's grain can be stored until the market's ready for it, and special machines for unloading a whole car full of grain without waste. Yes, sir, people will all eat better and live better because of railroading. And you just mark my words, this railroad right here, this railroad of ours, will be feeding whole cities like St. Louis and Detroit. Why, I can see it just as if I were there. Great produce terminals, regular beehives, kept filled with food all the time by our railroad. is going to take a powerful lot of rolling stock to run a really good railroad as I see it, and they'll have to spend all sorts of money. But the way I figure it, this country's got to have the railroads if we're going to grow big and stay strong.
reckon it's going to take people in just about every trade and profession to keep things running smoothly and on schedule. Wouldn't surprise me none if they figured out ways of actually seeing trains and controlling them maybe hundreds of miles away. That way, two trains could use the same track even though they were heading towards each other. Cause the dispatcher could signal one train to slow down and then set a switch to put it on a sidetrack, even though he was miles away and couldn't even see the two trains. That way, the other train can pass without a minute being wasted. Time's going to be mighty important to shippers, and the Wabash won't ever forget it. will be so big that when a train's about due, they'll use special long-distance riding systems to let all the railroad people know what train it is, what time it's coming in, and on what track. Of course, all the railroads will use each other's freight cars, and they'll find ways of keeping track of every car right down to the fraction of a mile. Railroads will work together, you mark my words. Young lady, how does it feel to make history? I guess I'll take the bluebird. <laughs> la 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 Let's see. Hmm, everything looks so good, I can't decide. The braised shoulder of lamb is very nice. Oh, isn't this exciting? Or perhaps the fried green scallops. Say, haven't I seen you someplace before? You may have, sir. I've been with the Wabash a long time. Most people stay with the Wabash a long time. Or would you prefer chicken croquettes? Salad bowl, baked ham, chicken sandwich, broiled whitefish, or perhaps a nice steak. Good night, honey. Make up your mind before I starve, will you? I think I'll take the first one, braised shoulder of lamb. Just like a woman. Listens to the whole list, then takes the first one. And what will you have, dear? Lamb. <laughs> Gosh, Molly. Just like a regular restaurant, isn't it? Well, nowadays, a dining car is a restaurant. There's no doubt of it. With the food cooked in kitchens the size of a cupboard, I'll bet. Most people think of a dining car kitchen as something like this. Actually, however, the modern streamliner's kitchen is a miracle of stainless steel efficiency. Preparing two or three hundred meals at one mealtime is routine for these boys. 
everything just shines. A good chef wouldn't have it any other way, even if he didn't have to meet the health requirements of every state the train passes through. Our commissary department puts a lot of time and thought into making our meals as tasty, as appetizing, and as pleasing to look at as we know how. The superintendent of dining cars plans them personally, figuring that nothing is more important to pleasant travel than food that looks good and tastes good. Last year, for example, we bought 25,368 pounds of meat and 156,200 pounds of potatoes, among other things, for the 804,129 meals served in our dining cars. I used to think of railroads as just hauling things from one place to another. I didn't realize they bought and used so much themselves. Well, railroads are big consumer, all right. That's one reason railroads are so important to the communities they serve. The regular shopping list of our purchasing department runs into tens of thousands of items. As a matter of fact, our total bill amounts to millions of dollars every year. Dollars that go right back into the community served by the Wabash. Of course, we're never through buying, because we're always figuring ways of improving things. If we can reduce a grade along the line, we can use longer trains and shorten schedules, give better service to both passengers and shippers. Same thing goes for straightening curves. In fact, we spare no effort to keep the roadbed in perfect condition and to keep things moving. We've made our big yard in Decatur one of the most modern anywhere. Electronic and other up-to-the-minute equipment makes it almost a push-button operation, all designed to keep the wheels rolling on Wabash tracks. Of course, all this effort to make our road second to none and keep it that way helps the community, too. A railroad helps the community in lots of other ways as well. For instance, we figure it's good business to create new business in our community, like this big automobile assembly plant. By helping to bring it into our territory, more than 3,000 new jobs were created. The Wabash hauls thousands of tons of material that goes into the cars and trucks that go to dealers and consumers. That means a healthier railroad, of course, but it also means better business for everybody all along the line. In fact, the men in our industrial department, all civil engineers, spend all their time showing businessmen the advantages of locating their plants in the communities served by the Wabash. And a great many industries have found in their balance sheets proof that it pays to locate on the wall. Yes, sir, practically everything we need and use in our daily lives depends in one way or another on the railroad. And if you really want to convince yourself, just imagine, just try to imagine what things would be like if the railroads suddenly stop running. Thank you. Glad you could be with us.
bluebird for a wonderful, wonderful ride. Ba da dum bum da dum bum 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 bum